Hi folks and welcome to the Mermaid Queen illustration. I'm going to be covering uh, my drawing process and my painting process on how I created this mermaid uh, this month. And um, just going straight into sketching, we have sped up the video obviously because um, the, t the artworks I do usually take um, around about three or four days, you know, 40 hour, a 40 hour week to do a finished painting. Um, and um, sometimes a bit more. <laughs> Here all I'm doing is I'm just sketching out ideas and just showing you the different, I did about three or four sketches before I settled on one idea. So you can see I'm just drawing mermaid in different poses and trying different anatomy or different uh, shapes and doing different things. Um, I started off with a placid design or more of a, I suppose, chilled out design, but then I went to a, I suppose, more of a defensive one, which is this one here, um, where she's holding a, a trident. and so. I did a really rough sketch, so I just explained what I did. I started off with a really rough sketch of it, and as you can see, it's very sketchy. Then I went over and just decided to go in and, and really draw it very, spend time on detailing it out more and making it, I suppose, correct in the drawing stage, because it's really important to get your drawing right with anatomy and with, with I suppose, your design, you know, because if you get your design right at the start, it then makes it a lot easier to, um, to paint everything because if you've got basically your drawings like your container and um, when you go to final color if your drawings right you don't have to stuff around with the anatomy you don't have to stuff around with anything fixing up things or making things better so the way I draw is I do a really rough sketch as you saw before of this of this um, mermaid with a trident and as it was really really bad and you know it didn't, didn't look good then I trace over the drawing that I've got and I look at references sometimes and I trace over it, and I'm and I actually um, perfect the line work, and I and I and I basically um, improve it as much as I can, and that takes a bit of time in getting used to, you know, the tra whole tracing method. And people go, "Oh, you're cheating because you're tracing," but in actual fact, a lot of people do work that way um, when they're creating illustrations, because it's kind of like you just you're just redrawing what you've done, but you're improving on your drawing skills. And um, you know, you never really get your drawing right from the start. And a lot of people they think, oh no, if I can't get it right from the start, it's not good. You know, I'm not a good artist. Well, you know, um, that's not the truth. <laughs> a lot of artists have known to trace their own drawings or or even references, and then they use that to then create their painting from. But um, in this case, this was my idea, my drawing of a mermaid and I just went over it and, and I just, you know, I suppose I added more fins, like when I trace over I added these nicer fins as you can see, cleaned up, you know, so you can see me there making the fin a little bit more dynamic, adding in these Doric ruins or ancient Greek ruins in the bottom there as well, sketching that in. And of course this is sped up so, you know, it took me a while to kind of perfect this line work and make it better. And then I, and I, and I obviously, obviously tracing over your or over your initial rough you can actually improve your face and your, your, your details of the character's face if you don't like it or you need to fix up lips or eyes or a nose or a mouth and that's a benefit of having an underdrawing or something that you're tracing over a lot of the animators at Disney and a lot of people that do animation and stuff they actually um, even concept artists they draw in pencil blue pencil even even then they're doing a traditional media even if they had no light box they would draw with a blue colored pencil and you get your under that be your underdrawing and then you trace on top of that with a we draw on top of the blue pencil and, and finish off in, and actually do the final drawing because blue it wasn't seen isn't seen well when you scan it in it's hard to get it your black lines your final lines only come out but it actually looks nice because I think it gives texture to the work like we've got two layers of lines here it actually gives textures a texture to the drawing itself as I'm creating this drawing of the mermaid so you know drawing is like oh, I have to confess and say like drawing is not my strength you know I am known as a painter and like I actually um, struggle with drawing a lot and that's why even when I'm going to New Zealand I'm going to be drawing from life a lot and I did actually did start out as a draw doing drawing a lot of life drawing and a lot of oil pastel workshops and drawing with pastels but that to me is like a form of painting and so because you're kind of blending charcoal or pastels together it's it is kind of a style painting although you're using a pencil medium it kind of is like mixed paint in a way so you know I'd recommend always drawing in your sketchbook you know whatever tool you use a surface pro or a Cintiq companion and um, 
yeah, so and I, I just stick to traditional media as much as I can, um, although I am very interested in other tools as well. So here I'm just like, I got rid of the underneath drawing and, and just was working on this fin and trying to make the fin better and trying to make it actually have more detail, um, make it look more interesting. You know, like I didn't want it to have a stand. I didn't want her to have a standard fin. She's a mermaid queen. So the story behind this idea is she's a mermaid queen, maybe like Ariel, but she's actually an older version of Ariel. But She's part of the comic book, Luminous Ages, so she's actually, her real name is Aphrodite, she's the queen of, of the water, of the oceans, and she's allied with one of the dragons, the sea dragons, the arc sea dragons, and um, that hasn't been designed yet, we're still working, we've got the idea written out in the script, but we're still working on concept designs for that. So that's a cool thing with Luminous Ages, you're all going to get some really awesome fantasy characters, a whole range of, a plethora of characters and gods and dragons and monsters and characters and there are all these sub races even mermaids and merfolk are in luminous ages and they have an impact as well they may not be out they may not have um they, they don't they're not blessed with the marks of the mage i.e they're not blessed to be luminaries or captivaries but what makes them unique is that they get the um they can they they have a lot of weapons that are imbued with luminary and captivary magic that's why she's holding the trident that's why this trident is really magical so she, and that's why she's got a lot of powers because she, although she's not a mage of the mark, um, she um, has the weapons that were crafted by the mage of the mark, which is the trident. And so that's the also part of the story of this illustration is I wanted her holding a weapon. Not she's not really attacking or really even defensive. She's kind of just chilling there, holding her staff. But the whole story that that's why we've I've drawn it with the trident, not because it just looks cool having a weapon or whatever. But also because um, it does. Now here I'm putting the divine proportions grid up, and I'm scaling her face so that it actually sits right bang on the the focal point of the divine proportion. So if you have a look at that grid that was just up then, um, I advise you pausing this and and looking at it because um, this goes so fast you might um, need to pause it sometimes. And and that's the benefit of having a video. You can pause what I'm doing and actually, you know, re-watch re a section of what I'm saying and, and that will hopefully help you. But anyway, um, the, um, yeah, as I was saying, the, the focus is her crest. You know, she's a queen. She's got a magical item, so it's imbued with magic and she's quite beautiful and, and a stunning mermaid still. She does look very uh, fish-like, you know. Anyway, so I was really happy with the pencil at that point. You know, I was just really happy with that design. I really liked the way the fin works. Um, the fin worked, and I liked the trident. I liked her head, her headpiece. You know, I wanted to. I didn't want to make it just you know this pretty f female face. You know, that looked human, totally human at the top. I wanted, her, I wanted her to be very creative, and I wanted her to have, you know, a fish, a fish. You know, still a, a human face, but a crown that was fish-like. You know, it's, it's a fish fin on her head, you know, and, and that's just part of me being crazy with my concept design. So all I'm doing here is I'm blocking in the color, the base color. And so I went in and blocked in her and I put the color that she was blocked in was a light blue. And all I did is I just simply um, blocked in one color and then put that in a separate layer. Make sure you always put things in a separate layer because um, what 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 you do by putting the actual um, artwork in a separate layer, the color, you're you're able to then work on the actual mermaid as by itself. So you can have the pencil and the actual color layer of the mermaid together, and you have the background in a separate layer. So as you can see, I've switched off everything. I've switched off the mermaid there and you saw the background color there. So that was really cool. I wouldn't say cool, but it's, you know, it's, it's, if you're going to be doing character art or even anything really that you want to be spending a lot of time on, if it's not just a rough concept, I really recommend separating your layers, separating your focal point, like your character or your architecture away from your background. Because that's really important because otherwise you're going to kind of be doubling up on your time you're going to be ah uh, like say if you paint this amazing piece and then you're like uh oh you know it's all in one layer i have to fix up the anatomy on that horse 
you're kind of in a bad spot. <laughs> you know, you've got to repaint that horse on top of all that other work that you've done. Or, I mean, you can save out a selection or you can drag and copy around and cut out a selection, but it's still, it's going to, it's going to take you time to fix it up. So this is why I always, when I'm painting, I always do it in um, layers. Now, if, as you can see here, I didn't go to grayscale in this. I just went straight to color. I was really confident that I, I wanted to explore color with this. Um, I must say the end result, I think looks good. I think it's a great, great piece. Uh, a lot of people have been liking it at comic conventions and it has been a really popular artwork. Um, and the color is great. And I'm, I'm glad I did go to color first because that's what sped it up. However, um, I'm still, you know, for my portfolio and submitting this into studios like Magic the Gathering, I'm going to tweak it again because I'm just a really fussy person. Um, and not just that, you know, the, the colors that I've used have been eye-popping colors because the, this is what draws my fans in is the, is the really saturated colors. And it's obviously what draws a lot of people to my art is this, this great contrast and these sat overly saturated colors. But when you're creating artwork for, say, clients like Magic the Gathering, when you look at the color palette, and this is exactly what directors have told me from Magic the Gathering um, and, and co lead concept artists, um, they basically have said, you know, you've got to, you know, they said to me, my work is solid, but look at, you know, you might have to change the color, the, the temperature, you know, the contrast and the temperature in the work. You know, maybe it's a little bit too saturated or maybe, you know, the blues are too blue. You know, make, can you put more darks or desaturate areas? And, and that's because it's a different market. You know, if I, you know, that with Magic the Gathering, you're looking for a different kind of film. Um, and you know, for as an art pinup poster, it's it's going to have a totally different aesthetic as well. Because if it's too dull and just looks too grey, if the art is too grey, it's not going to draw people over at, at Comic Con. And people, are, I mean, it's not like that people aren't going to buy it, but it's going to decrease the chances of people wanting to purchase that work. And for me, that's also an important part because I want to please people like you, my patrons, who are always happy with what I do and I'm also also open to you know people's suggestions as well so if you do want to see work that's less saturated I will do that as well <laughs> but um you know so it's just that's when I started out doing this mermaid I just went straight to color and as you can see I'm just getting all sorts of colors all sorts of blues and playing around with the blues and the greens and you can see I just started putting suggestion of scales on her fins and just painting everything and I what at this point I merged the layer together the pencil with the color and that way I was able to just keep on going um, it's really important to do that just keep on going a lot of the time a lot of times people you know they lose their momentum or they lose motivation with their work you know you know I, I have been prone to that but what you've got to do is you've got to actually Put your paint down, start blocking color in, and eventually your work will come together. So here I'm just blocking in the boat, that the sunken ship that she's sitting on. And she's looking, it's starting to pop, pop her out a little bit. So, you know, I, I actually got some reference of what it looks like under the sea. You know, what is the water like under the sea? And it's good to look at that. Um, I, I have to admit that I should have pulled away from the reference as well. And um, towards the end, you can, it's actually better to also pull away and go, you know, you don't actually have to copy exactly the photo reference for, say, oceans or water. You can actually... You know, use it as a guide, but then change the color scheme to what you want. If you want it to look more green, go for more green. If you want it to look darker, you can go darker underneath. And that's what I'm. That's eventually what I will be doing with the work. Is um, when I submit it to Magic, probably make the background really, really, really dark and make her pop out extremely well. So you'll be able to see the mermaid really well versus a dark ocean. 
but you know this is the thing like when you are working under the pump and we and i had this literally only had to work a week to kind of do this you know in and out of conventions and and kind of back and forth you know it, art good art does take time so sometimes it takes a couple of weeks to do the work one week to do the work and a week to review it you know a week to kind of give yourself more time to, for reflection to go back to it and this is why i prefer sometimes i prefer to do um book covers or or illustration projects even if i did do stuff for magic the gathering i would like you know i'm pretty sure they'd give me two weeks to, to get something done you know they'd have edits and changes and and at least if you've got two weeks per illustration, or if, even if you're working on three, in a busy studio like mine, we sometimes have had three projects on the go, um, or I've had three projects on the go, and so I have three paintings I'm working on at once over a period of a month, or four, even four paintings. So you could say, oh, that's one painting a week, but if I get the whole month to do the four paintings, I can, once I finish one painting, I can then, uh, once I've got one painting to a really good point and I give it to my client to review or I'm sick of looking at it and I can't see the errors in the painting I then jump to the next painting start on the next concept for whoever it is or the next book cover and once that's done I get to submit that for review and then I'll wait for the other artist other clients to get back to me and then once I look at the painting again with fresh eyes, it's the painting I have. I can go then approach it and attack it in a different light and fix up any errors that were popping out, I suppose. And um, yeah, so all I'm doing here is I'm starting to add shadows to the mermaid. I'm adding in all sorts of stuff, so a lot of scales. Um, I'm suggesting scales here. I'm just putting light. And I suppose more more so what I'm doing here is I'm suggesting where the light is. As you can see, I've got a bit of light hitting her, the top of her cheekbone, the top of her nose, the top of her ear. I just start to suggest color. And if you saw before, I started to suggest red color in the hair, and I didn't like the red. And then I said to myself, you know what, I'm going to do pink hair. <laughs> um, and because, I know that sounds a bit silly, but, you know, I, I well, reddish pink hair, only because... Um, I like fiery red hair or pink hair, whatever it is. So I ended up going for this pink, pinkish kind of red color, a deep pink, only because it worked better for me, and um, and that's and it gave contrast. It draw it draws attention. You can use color to draw attention into a focal point. In this case, the focal point is her face, then second the staff, right? So when you look at her face. Um, having red hair really draws your eye into her face and her that she's the status of her being a queen and then your eyes led into the staff and then you see the rest of the painting and that's that was pretty much why I went to red hair instead of the blue hair at the end because it creates a focal point it creates visual interest contrast You've got pink and blue also another piece of advice that I have for you all is in this painting I've got some greens and suggestions of orange colors there um, but they're just very desaturated oranges they become very brown at the end or they become less saturated my advice is if you're going to use say primaries in your color in this case the primary is blue like a cyan there's a very strong cyan there the other um, primary you use um, you know is the one I use is pink or red it's, we'd say it's the pink and they're the two they're the two colors that are contrasting with each other but never use a third primary unless your painting is like a crazy Alice in Wonderland garden with pink red yellow flowers and green and blue and it's a multicolored environment um, when you start using three primaries in a painting the problem is the biggest problems you you have with three primaries is competing for attention Okay, your subject, you'll be competing for attention in your subject su subject matter. And that's why I specifically went for pinks and blues and a touch of green and no yellow. So if I added yellow to it, then say if I added yellow to the staff, then the staff would really be competing for attention versus the, the, the trident versus the mermaid. So just a tip for you, um, if you do have to use the three primary colors in your painting, be careful. 
As you can see there, I grabbed an underwater version of an, a Doric, a Greek Doric, and I dumped it in and did a color balance on it, and it fits, and it actually fit really well as the photo. I did paint on top of that in the end, and I did a cutout filter to give it to to make it look less like a photo. And then I painted on top of that and made it look more textured. So, and, and so as you can see, I'm painting over the photo, so it looked like a painting, not like a photo. And I just scaled that down, I made it very small. It's just to suggest that there are some Greek ruins in the background, you know, or, you know, Roman, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and so, as you can see here, see how I've got the, the whole mermaid in one layer? It makes it so easy. See, like, I, I can actually go control, hit control and click, and I'm able to go in and actually paint on top of that and re and colorize that layer without touching the background at all and that's the benefit is when you start colorizing and detailing everything which in this in this case I'm putting pink in the hair I'm not putting pink in the ocean because that can be a really big problem if you've got pink back in the ocean you like unless there's light ref reflecting back there um, you're gonna have big problems. So it's a really good idea to make a clean selection of your character, tidy it up as you go, make it clean and crisp, and that way your edges are, are nice and hard and defined, and they're not, you know, you're not basically painting into the wrong area. As you can see, I'm cleaning up everything. I'm going around the edges and tidying up everything. So really, all I'm, all I'm doing at this stage is just rendering and placing things in, like just rendering, I'll, I'll move that Doric around. And um, I'm just painting as much, you know, hair strands as I can, as much info as I can, as much detail as I can. And, and literally, this is all digitally painted. So, apart from the suggestion of some architectural things that we, I use some photo reference in, it's all painted. as you can see just really I'm um, just putting in the hair and just it's just still rough you know it's very very rough at this point but I'm I'm starting to work out the light source and where, where does the light come from how do the, all the forms work the good thing about having that pencil totally finished I didn't have to change anything all I'm doing now because I've got that pencil def, uh, fixed up there's nothing wrong with the anatomy there's nothing wrong with the design all I'm doing now is I can now focus on rendering the whole thing, you know, and that's good. That's why it's, it is important to draw. And I sometimes, a lot of times, I do draw all my designs, but sometimes I just go straight to blocking and paint, painting in with environments. But I think with characters, you really need to draw, and you really need to get your drawing right, and refine the drawing, trace over your drawing, clean it up as much as possible, because that saves you time. You know, this could have taken two weeks if I didn't get the anatomy right, if I didn't get the um, face looking good you know all I really want to do is now to it like I said is the only thing I'll do for it for my portfolio is adjust the contra the focal points you know adjust the lighting in it and not the actual mermaid there's nothing wrong with her and that anatomically speaking you know when I showed it to some friends they said yeah it looks really good you know anatomically there's nothing wrong with it you know and I like to show art to colleagues and other people in the studio and friends only because it's good to get another opinion on art on, on ideas and stuff it's always good so yeah just keep on I'm, I'm rendering and I, as you can see that in that corner it's the layer is called the mermaid layer I've got the, the layer for the ship and then I've got the layer for the background the ocean I've got the actually the background has a pencil drawing and then it's got the color for the suggestion of the color in the background but it's all good, it's all happening. Just rendering up everything. And again, you know, people constantly ask me what brush do you use? I'm just using a soft brush or a hard brush depending on where I'm painting. You know, there's no magical brush. 
that I use. You know, there's a whole range of brushes that you all have in the in the when you download them from me. So um, so now that everything's locked in, what I start to do is then I, I start to go into the face and start figuring out things like the eyes, the eyebrows, the lips. Uh, the structure of the face and I start painting in all the lighting and getting everything right, you know, around her face the Details around her nose all that sort of stuff Because I've got everything blocked in the most important thing obviously is the face and we want people to look at that, you know, stunning face And so what I, what I advise you do once you've got everything blocked in like I've got the, the rough background blocked in I've got the mermaid's body the, the ship she's on blocked in I recommend you actually go and render the crap out of the focal point you know which is in this case it's the hands it's the it's the upper torso or the mermaid the face everything leading into the face I mean I still noodle around and clean and add more detail across the whole thing but the first your first priority should be focusing on that face getting the face right or, or the focal point right and as you can see I've, I've pulled up some references of a mermaid that I found or someone that cosplays mermaids and I've actually got her face and I'm using the face as a reference as a guide I don't copy her exactly because it ended up looking like my cousin for some reason <laughs> I've got a cousin um, and it looks exactly like her it's really weird it doesn't look anything like the actual model I think and just the changes that I made subconsciously to the painting, I pulled away from the reference and I just kept on painting on the face of my mermaid. Maybe because like all my family, my friends are in my, my photographic memory in my mind. I ended up painting it to look like my cousin Georgia. And uh, she, she saw it and she started laughing. She was like, oh my God, that does look like me. How did you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. Okay, maybe I've been hanging around with you guys for too long. So it was really funny. Um, but yeah, you can, I mean, I'm not copying that reference. I'm just looking at it. Like you can see in the, in the reference, she's got uh, an open mouth. Mine, it does have an open mouth in the end, but you can see I kind of just, I started off with a closed mouth and the ears are totally different. The hair is totally different. She's got a fin on her head. My character has like spikes coming out of her chin line, you know, but it's still good to look at references just to get the, the details of the face right. You know, and then I zoom out and I'm having a look and just checking everything. So, like I said, focusing on that focal point. That sounds really funny, focusing on the focal point. Um, yeah, just adding as much detail and sh I'm adding all my shadows in based upon what this reference is. And again, you can see the reference, she's got like blonde hair and she has highlights in the hair and she's underwater. So the hair looks kind of blue. It's reflecting the light that's coming through the water but my character has got pink pinkish red hair like kind of like Ariel from the Little Mermaid so with that in mind I have to paint the darks that are the darks that, that are the dark reds not the dark blues now I have to use different values and different colors when I'm painting the hair even though I'm looking at the reference okay okay it goes quite dark there I use the slider up in the right hand corner and I drop down the black I, I use more blacks stuff so yeah it's all happening and yeah it's all coming together which is really awesome pretty happy with that and as you can see the ear is totally different I've added little fins on the ear I made them really big and pointy almost like elven ears actually they're more like goblins ear <laughs> they're huge um, actually the ears aren't even a, a, like a humanoid ear they almost look like a big fin coming off the side of her face which is what I wanted you know and I didn't have reference for that so I have to kind of fake it I have to kind of wing it in a way and so you know so that's where that's that's probably the right way to use reference is to paint not paint the reference but paint from the reference you know look at something there's nothing wrong with looking at something and going Okay, well, look, I like that face. I like I like how the light's in that. I'm going to copy how the light's in that. I'm going to copy where the shadows are going. I'm going to copy some of the structure, the, the pose of a face, but I'm going to make it my own. I'm going to change it. And I did, like, the finished product looks nothing like the model in the photo. You know, like I said, it looks like my cousin. It doesn't look like the mermaid model. <laughs> and so that's where, that's where it's really important 
that's why I really, I suppose I'm passionate about it. When, when a lot of people say to me, oh, you know, you, when they, they feel bad, other artists say they, they feel bad when they use reference, they just can't paint from their head. Um, you know, I don't think any art, any real professional artist can totally paint everything from their head. Um, maybe someone that's been doing it for 20 years and maybe they've studied this topic for so long they know how to paint people's faces for so long but I think even if they do paint something from their head it's not going to be realistic it's not going to be photo realistic it's not going to have um, that sense of believability it's going to be it might be an artist that's really good at doing manga or it might be an artist that's really good good at doing comics you know but when you're doing fantasy illustration you need to create suspension of disbelief and what that means is because fantasy is so far out you need to add you have to have you have to actually have real world elements in it so you need real lighting you need creating good fantasy illustration is the combination of imagine imagination and reality and so you need to actually use photo like i've seen a lot of really good fantasy artists the top people in the industry like a guy like, like some people like John Howe, um, who do, did the Lord of the Rings movies, he's paint he painted this fantasy forest, but he's got like on his canvas, on his original acrylic canvas, he's got photos right next to it of the four forests he likes, the four different types of waterfalls, and he paints from that reference and creates his design. And he and because there's no way that our brains can record absolutely everything in the, on the, on this planet Earth. <laughs> You know, if, if that's possible and if there's humans out there that can, great, I'm happy for them, that's amazing, I, I really am, am amazed um, and it's great that they can do that. But even professionals that have been studying for years and make, doing studies from life and, and whatever, they still use reference, they paint from the reference. You know, even if they do copy the reference, there's nothing wrong with that, if they do something creative with that, that's great. If they don't do something creative with it and they just want to study reference, that's even better. It's whatever you want. But all I'm saying is don't be scared to use reference. A lot of people come to me and they say, how do I draw a tree? How do I draw an eye? How do I draw a mouth? How do I draw this? Go and study it. You know, unless you um, don't know how to draw a dragon. I mean, even a dragon, you can study how to draw a dragon. Look at how other artists paint dragons. Go look at the anatomy of a Komodo dragon. Go look at the anatomy of a lion, of a tiger. And so, and the same with this, when I was painting this fin, I was looking at the anatomy of fishes. I actually had pictures of goldfishes up, goldfish up in my thing, and I'm gonna provide all those references. You get all those references. So you can see, I actually looked at the goldfish fins and how they worked. And at the end of the, the painting, I actually made like the fins look translucent, you know, so that they kind of had this, you know, this translucency to the art. But yeah, it's just um, uh, yeah. Anyone starting out, even even if you're not starting out, you're intermediate, like you you know, or you're you're going towards an advanced level. Um, what I recommend is is like you know, don't be scared to to still use reference or go go to you know look at references of things as I do, and I'm not going to lie about that. As you can see, I, I'm I'm crop, cropping out things like statues and dumping them in, <laughs> and I'm looking at them. I mean, sometimes I'm dumping photo references and it doesn't work, but usually I paint the whole thing or paint on top of the photo if I do dump a photo in. So here I've added another Doric, a few Dorics in the background, and I end up painting on top of them and blending them into the scene so they look more painted. <laughs> And all I've done is add a color balance to each one of those Dorics so that way um, they look more blue and they fit with the scene. So you can add more cyan or, or magenta to fit to the to fit to the ocean colors. The ocean's colors, should I say. And at this point, I also darkened up the background. So I, I did darken up the background. It still wasn't dark enough because I ended up doing some other things to it and it made it look um, still bright in the background like with all the effects. So yeah, it just darkened up the background. That way she pops out more. 
because she's the focal point. And just adding more shadows to her, I'll go back and paint in the mermaid layer and just added a lot of shadows, highlights. Where does where do the light where does the light hit the fins? You know, where does the light hit the shadows? Uh, you know, where do the shadows, sorry, the light don't hit the shadows. <laughs> you know, drawing in scales as well, suggesting scales that you can see. I started at sketching in the scales and I did that with the smudge brush actually. I just smudged the dark into the light area and it created an effect. I actually started to look like scale, little fish scales, which was interesting. So at this point, I'm just cleaning it all up. I'm using the eraser tool, cleaning up all the edges. It's really important to do that. Make it crisp on the edges, still cleaning that up, getting rid of any sort of loose ends to make it as crisp as possible, make the character really crisp and pop out. So back to the face. <laughs> Once everything else got a bit more detail, then it's a matter of pushing the focal point again. So for me, I kind of the way I work is very sporadic, but the whole idea is okay, push the focal point, do all the work on the focal point, and then once you're happy with the focal point to a degree, then go and fix up the rest of the painting. In this case, fix up the rest of the mermaid. Then once you're happy with the whole design again, go back to the mermaid's face, the focal point, and tidy that up even more. And I know it's back and forth, but it does work for me because like, I like to, it, it's not about even working for me. It's good to get everything painted at once because you build up the painting all together at once. That way you can see overall, is this working? Does this work? Does it not work? Um, what What is good about it? What's not good about it? And you can fix up problems early on as well. So that's just how I work. If you don't like working like that, that's cool. I totally understand. I'm not going to judge you for it, but it's something I recommend it. I'm just recommending it. Just an idea. No sweat. Okay. Just rendering her up. I added like um, gills to her cheek, cheekbones. So she's got like gills where she breathes in. And I added in a whole bunch of, you know, shadows around the upper torso, the focal point. So I'm just colouring her eyes, making them blue. And adding more highlights to the face. This point is really getting rid of as much of that line work and painting over it and really blending everything so it starts to look like a proper skin surface, you know. And so it has the highlights, it has form, you know, it looks like it's an actual physical thing in the world.
this point just more, more adding more details to the hair, texture to the hair. A lot more and highlights to the eyes as well. So you have your you know white highlights so that way it looks more lifelike. Doing the character this way with the full body, you know, the whole mermaid thing. Obviously you see she's a mermaid and she's got a cool design and stuff, but it is a lot more work than say just doing an upper torso character design, you know. Um, because you've got to really get everything right. If you have a look here, I'm, I start painting, painting in the fins, and I'm actually looking at the goldfish. How do their fins work? I like goldfish. I think they look really nice and pretty. And so I'm, what I'm doing is I'm like adding very thin strands, and then soft with the soft brush, you know, I add the the kind of like, I know, opaque layer of color, and then and I'm just looking at and stud. It's really I'm studying how goldfish fins work. So now I know how they work, and I'm using that as guidance to create my fish fins, which is lots of fun. And so just cleaning up the hands and it's good I did use the reference again of that mermaid model and I looked at the way she's got her hands like she's not holding anything in the picture but what I did is I used the guide the lighting as guidance how what does the lighting look like underwater because it's really hard to mimic lighting underwater you know unless you're underwater yourself with the camera and but I made my hand so it wraps around the trident more like she's actually gripping the trident so this is where you actually use reference but you also have to use your imagination and imagine what would it really look like if the hand is grabbing that trident what would it actually how would it sit you know how the how would the shadows fall and so that's where the challenge that's where as an illustrator you kind of have to if the reference doesn't do what you want it to do you have to change the drawing you have to make it different and as you can see, the finger, the index finger is in a different position, totally different position to the photo. And same with the rest of the fingers. They're actually tighter around that, that trident. And it's really important to do that. You know, make, keep in mind that even if you use reference, you know, you make sure that you um, are comfortable with changing it. You know, like can you paint from reference and, and like even if your hand is only half, you know, say if you've got your hand and it's, halfway closed can you still paint use that reference and paint your hand so it's fully closed or three-quarter closed and if you and that's that's actually a skill that's in itself trying to do that get getting that right so here I'm making sure the selections working going into grayscale mode as well back to the face and faces because of faces it is a focal point it's really important to really push it as much as you can the lighting make it pop as much as you can and because there's a lot of subtleties in human faces you know that in, in terms of shadows in terms of lighting got to get it right you know so So yeah, just adding in more shadows into the face and really popping out the highlights because you really want to make sure your darkest darks and your lightest lights are in the focal point and in this case they're in the face. So you've got your really bright whites in the face and the hair and you get your dark shadows behind the, the neck and in the eyes as well. So as you can see, she, her eyebrows are also going up, pointing up versus down like in the actual photo reference because I wanted to give her kind of this 
I suppose powerful, powerful eyes or powerful eyebrows that look really, I suppose they pop out. So, hope that makes sense. Hope I'm making sense. <laughs> Again, um, also if you've got any questions to ask me, feel free to ask me anything um, on the Patreon. You can send me private messages. Um, I'll do my best to respond. Um, usually, I can get to my iPad and respond, or I can respond on my computer if I'm not, you know, if I'm home in the office or whatever. So that's what Patreon's for. It's there. To, it's a community where you can ask me questions on a message or on the on the forums. You can ask me stuff um, if I posted something and you're not sure about. And that's what I'm trying to build a community where I'm helping people online and creating my stuff and hoping that people like it. Um, yeah, so here I'm just really refining the whole face, you, you know, cleaning it up as much as possible. And I think I even used the line tool there to really make these gills pop out a little bit more. Lots of fun. And just adding more details into the hair, the face. More strands of hair is always good. Funny quote I saw once was, um, well, funny it, it, it argument I had once. I wouldn't say it was an argument. Actually, it was just something I saw online was, People talking about you know digital painting versus traditional painting, and I I'm, I support all media. I think everything is great. You know I, I use all media, acrylic, digital, and whatever, and and I kit bash. You know, and I'm going to have a video where I do some kit bashing as well, and show you all how I can kit bash stuff as well, as bonus videos or as when I get time. You know, even as the main videos, I'm going to show you how to make like a photo. Start off with a photo manipulation, then turn it into a digital painting. Um, there's a lot of that. You know. Is, is a great way to work um, for certain people but anyway there's someone that was like you know making a comment about tools and media and when someone turned around and said well if you're going to be you know if you think that real painting you know painting with acrylic is you know is real art you're going to you know you're going to attack people for using digital tools versus traditional art then you might as well go back and paint with egg whites you know uh, egg tempera painting because, um, and that's kind of, that is very true, you know, I mean, I actually studied egg tempera painting when I first went, in, went to fine art school. I studied how to paint with egg whites and using um, pigments. So you actually get, you know, broken down pigments from, you know, uh, clay or whatever. And you create red, blue, you use pigment dust and you mix it in with the egg white. And, or you can actually get paint itself. And so if you have a look at even paint technology, paint itself is a technology. Uh, paint has changed and I'm talking about acrylic paints paints have been refined so much some of the brands like Liquitex and Golden There's a lot of technology that goes into making them and getting them right So if you're going to attack someone for using digital painting tool versus acrylic painting and say oh, it's not real art Then you're kind of silly in a way because <laughs> even painting today has evolved as a form of is, is a form of technology and yes you could say, oh, painting is harder. Yes, it is harder in some degrees, but it's also easier in some degrees. Um, when you paint traditionally with acrylics, you don't have the zoom function. You can have a magnifying glass to paint in more detail, but you can't zoom in and keep on painting detail. In digital, digital painting, you have to, well, when you want to get something right, you, you zoom in, like I'm zooming in on this face. You saw how far I went in. Um, you constantly, this, and, and, and um, you have to constantly zoom in and get that right. So, you know, for the purists out there, if anyone ever attacks you and says, oh, you know, digital painting is an art, you should track paint with real paint, um, you know, you could always say, okay, in that case, have you got any eggs to give me? Because um, I need to paint with egg whites, I need to go to egg tempera. And that's how I um, actually, like I said, that's how I started out painting. Um, I don't do egg tempera now because um, of, of my, because of ethical reasons, I don't use animal products in my paints. Um, and but but it's that was years ago when I was young, you know, when I was 20 and, and before I was considered the environmental impacts. But um, you know, all I'm saying is, you know, all tools are great. You know, they all have their strengths and weaknesses, and and all techniques have their strengths and weaknesses. 
you know, and don't feel ever like, you know, I would say don't just stick to using digital media and don't just stick to using traditional media. Use everything, you know, that's that's my philosophy. Um, and, I, and I often do sketches, I doodle in my sketchbook when I can and I do traditional drawings as you all know for Patreon supporters and, and I, I just sketch in my sketchbook for fun when I'm free, you know, I just I don't show most of my sketches, I'm not really, some there's some sketches I'm like Oh, no one's going to see that ever, because <laughs> it's always a worry. You know, you always sometimes you have this self-doubt, but you know it doesn't mean you don't keep on trying and practicing. So, what am I doing here? I'm just going in and um, painting everything as much as possible. getting the trident right. I actually ended up selecting, pulling the trident out, copying and pasting it out and putting that in a separate layer as well because that the trident is a focal point and it needed to add more texture and more information to it as well. So always be wary of that, those sort of things. Just making sure that that look the trident actually looks sharp and has a hard surface. Here I'm actually look. You see me looking on the internet. I'm actually looking for um, re photo references of tridents because I'm trying to get ideas from it. I ended up getting. I found this awesome reference and I ended up dumping it in here. But I ended up photo kit bashing it and painting it into the scene. So you don't know that it's. A, I mean, you can't tell that it's a photo. But I actually grabbed the edge of the trident, the actual spiky bits and I copy and pasted them in and then painted on top and blended it into the whole design and that was really cool because it gave me like it allowed me to really I suppose make up my own version of it based on the photo reference I don't recommend always doing that but in this case I was really stuck for ideas I was just like mm, what can I do I can keep on drawing and, and coming up with different ideas but I was just like nah the trident needs to be a bit more interesting than it is and so yeah it ended up looking cool in the end I was really happy with the trident Because uh, obviously the trident is, you know, in luminous ages, it's it's an artifact that is imbued with the magic of of the luminary or the captive fairies. Um, and I can't tell you how it's done, and I can't tell you what the magic is about because you're going to be able, to, you're going to read about the magical powers. By the time where you start to hear about Thrakos's powers, and by the end of the first issue, um, and then you'll start to see the powers come at, being released in the second issue and the third issue of the comic. The comic is um, is getting there. We're just really pushing all the pages out, and also I'm really editing. I'm working with my editor to make sure the wording is better. Um, I, I write. He's he actually says my writing style is good. I just need to. He's obviously fixing up grammatical issues, and part of that problem is the reason why there are grammatical errors is because I am so busy painting and creating the concept art, the world, and coming up with the ideas. Sometimes I just I rush the editing part, I don't prove my own work enough, but that's all good, that's why you hire an editor, and that's why you hire people to help out on the project, and he's, Anthony L is an amazing editor, a really great guy from Melbourne, um, extremely uh, great to work with, and was recommended to me by um, one, a really great comic book writer in Melbourne called Paul Bedford, who created a, a comic book called The List, who's actually, which is actually being sold off as a movie, um, the film rights have been sold off, and he's you know, so working with really having really amazing people around me that I've become befriended and have, and and give me their, their, their I suppose they they connect me with really cool people that help have helped them has been amazing and it's part of the journey of of doing freelance as you meet amazing people after a while and and helpful people as well that you know can guide you and stuff like that. You make a lot of friends. Yeah, so as you can see, I just copied and pasted, you know, the pearl from that trident, the, the little ornate metal thing, things that I'm painting on top of them, and really cleaning that up. And it's all painted in a separate layer, so that way, if I did screw it up, um, I did make an error of it, 
um, I I can then fix it up. I can then cop, cop, delete the the new one and put back in the old or paint that. I don't ruin the hands because obviously I, I got, got those hands were looking really good. Got a lot of details in those hands. Got looking really nice. This is really strange um, when you're painting things like this. You know, you can switch off. You can actually merge layers. Like you can see here, I'm I'm switching on the photo the photo bash layer, and then I'm switching on my layer, the painted, and I'm blending that together so it all looks painted. And it can create weird effects, and can actually obviously make something even better <laughs> you know so putting that the photo in, a, in an overlay mode is, which is what I did and then putting it on top of my painting it changes it dramatically and it looks more like a trident you know so this is where like you know you, you really have to experiment with Photoshop you know people go oh Photoshop is experiment uh, it's, you just press a button and that's it it's not you know Photoshop like painting you experiment with layers you experiment with color mode you experiment with a color dodge layer or whatever it is you do it's the same as you know if I when I start using acrylic mediums like like I said the technology of painting has has dramatically improved I paint with acrylic paint paints I use Liquitex paints and I started out with egg tempera then I, I used oils when I did my fine art degree and then I studied um, acrylic painting because my lecturer actually said I, my lecturer at the time was a great guy called Rob not the Rob that who is my mentor now but um, a guy called Rob, um, I actually can't remember his last name. I, I feel really bad because I haven't spoken to him for, for eight years because nothing wrong. I just He left the university and is now teaching at the South Australian School of Art. But what he said was when the technology of acrylic, I asked him, how do you, because he, he does photorealism. And I said, how do you create photorealistic paintings with acrylic paint, with paint? What paint do you use? He says, I use acrylic. And the reason why is acrylic allows you to glaze in very fast. You can glaze in using a painting mediums. They're called uh, gloss varnishes or a Liquitex varnish medium. And I get a, a gloss varnish medium from Liquitex. It's the, the semi-gloss one. And what that what you can do with that medium is you mix it in with a bit of paint, like your red or your blue, and you can glaze in light amounts of blue. And you can really glaze in shadows and lighting your lighting to make it look real, very realistic and that's how I painted my pirate ship painting was doing that and that's what creates the believability this is why I was saying technology is what matters um, the painting liquid the glazing mediums have dramatically improved in the last 20 years to create that level of realism and quality that that weren't in paints say in the 70s or the 60s 1960s so that's why pho photorealism in, in acrylic painting became a movement because of that because of the technology in paint had improved. So, I mean, yeah, there were maybe there were some painters, oil painters and egg tempera painters that did some very realistic work in the 16th century and the 18th century. Yeah, they, were, they did amazingly realistic work, you know. But the photorealist movement, which was hyper-realistic, it was so realistic you thought it was a photo or you thought you were walking into the canvas that that level of the, the glazing quality was was because the paints had become better the paint mediums the, the amount of the tones and and the hues and the colors that you could buy had had jumped up like dramatically so you not so you know what i'm trying the point i'm trying to make is technology um it does improve stuff so you use digital digital painting is just another tool that makes things better for creating your art and that's how you have to view it um, so here you go, I've copied and pasted a bit of it, like a, a spear or a trident part that I found online and I've just kind of rotated it on an angle and I've designed my own trident from it. So what I've done is, okay, yeah, I've, I've stolen a photo from somewhere, but what I've done is I've cop co copied and pasted bits of it that I like of this metalwork and then I've painted it on top of my spear and my trident 
and made it my own. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. There's, I'm not breaching any copyright. I'm not, I'm not cheating. And you can see how I'm cutting into the design. I'm actually cutting around the edges and cleaning it up. And I'm like, yeah, that looks really cool. I'm like zooming out. I'm like, yep, this is how I want my trident to look. So I did the same thing on the other end. And I applied a color balance. I did a levels adjustment as well. So I pulled out the white so that it looked more darker on the bottom, looked darker on the bottom layer. So it's really important, like when you're actually looking at um, doing digital art um, and, and bringing in photo work, there's nothing wrong with bringing in photos. Just make it look painted. And that's the tip that I get from a lot of concept designers and even professional illustrators. Nothing wrong with working with a photo in your piece. But make sure that photos you paint on top of that photo as much as you can or you blend it into your painting, into your digital art, so that it all still looks like a painting. And so that, the, that, that you know, the people that are viewing it um, can't, it's not about not telling, but it, when people look at it, it's all harmonious. You know, I, I've got no problems with admitting that I use Photoshop brushes and using photo textures in some of my work. But, um, you know, if I paint something totally without photo textures, I let people know that I do that as well. You know, but the, the, the reality is if I had like another week, if I had three weeks on this to create this all with acrylic painting, I'm pretty sure I, I could spend a week on making a digital painting that like was amazing. And then two weeks on turning that into an original painting from that digital file, using it as reference to make an amazing acrylic painting. And, um, and, there's not, and that's how a lot of fantasy artists actually work. Uh, they create their file, they create their art, I suppose they create their painting digitally. You know, they might put in some photo textures or they, they, they make, make a digital file and then they print that off and they use that as art reference and they create their original from that. Um, they design their painting and that saves money on materials. It's good for the planet. It's good for um, your art budget. You know, not everyone, you might not be able to afford, you know, uh, 40, you know, $40 tubes of golden paint all the time or Liquitex paint, but if you can design your painting before you actually paint the painting, you save yourself on materials as well and money. And that's really important with when you're an artist, you obviously got a budget. You can't sit there, blow $500 on paint supplies every time you create a new painting because you're going to be out of pocket. You're not going to be out. You're going to have to sell your work for $50,000, you know, not 50, but $5,000. And not everyone's going to pay $5,000 for a painting. So what I'm doing here is I've added in a little bit of photo texture of, of fish scales into her, um, into her, into her tail, and I just copy and paste it around, and I'm moving it around. I'm using the warp tool just to to smash it around, and and I'm putting that that into different layer modes as well, and I'm using a clone stamp to just stamp it around and spread that texture around. As you can see. Again, that photo texture is in a very soft light layer. It's in a soft light layer. It, the opacity is down by 50%, and it's not much of a difference. It's just a subtle, a subtle addition of photo texture. That's all it is. And away you go. You can actually use that. You know, um, and it still blends in with the painting. It, it, it doesn't look like a photo. It just looks like a bit of photo. Instead of sitting there going in and painting every single scale, I can add in a texture that simulates the painting. And this is my gamut warning. You really got to be careful. This you can go and can go to view and view your gamut warning. And here you can actually see that the reason why I actually have to change the color mode for my portfolio is because the gamut warning, the RGB mode, the blues are very highly saturated. And so the problem with that is when it prints, it doesn't look exactly like how you see it on the digital file. Um, it's very close, but the problem is. Um, you, you, in Photoshop, you can check your gamut warning, and and I did adjust it, but you, it still needs. Even now that the painting's finished, it looks pretty good as a print. But I'm still for my portfolio and to submit to the big studios this piece when it's finally done. I'm going to have to go through do some gamut warning checks. So that's under view and go to gamut warning. And the gamut warning, what that tells you is it tells you where is it too saturated. Now are the color, are these blues too saturated? And it gives you a warning of how what areas are going to not going to appear are going to be blown out which areas are going to be like overly saturated like overexposed like with a camera when it goes to printing and so you really need to always be considerate of that when you're doing your painting very important 
I risked it with this one and it does work as a fine art print, as a pinup poster. It works having the gamut warning way off and having the saturation very high. It's an art piece that really stands out to people when they see it. And like I said, we've been selling a lot of it, of the work and, and people like it. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's just like, well, what can you do? <laughs> you know, you got to risk it sometimes. And, you know, it's all like I'm still learning. You know, this is why this is the thing about, I love about art. And this is the, the attitude you have to have is that art is a continual learning process. Now, even me painting this painting, I'm, I'm pretty good with understanding anatomy now and character design and painting creatures. I'm, I'm, I suppose my focus is creature design and environments. That's what I, I, I really am good at, like with a Cheshire cat and monsters and dragons and that. But I'm constantly learning, you know, still learning about, you know, each painting. This one, I learned that, you know, if you have uh, cyans that are too saturated in paintings, they're not going to print up properly. And it worked in some of my environments because I had a different hue, I had a different type of cyan. But there are some science, cyans you've got to really be careful of and they blow up, they blow up and they, I wouldn't say they blow up, but they're so saturated that you lose the detail in your painting when they print. You actually, it looks like an overexposed photo. So that's something that I learned on this painting. You know, I already knew about all the stuff, but you, you, you learn by experience. I only learned on the experience of painting this piece of art, painting an artwork that's under in, in the ocean underwater with this character. So when, you, when you're creating art, you're not going to know everything straight away. And you've just got to be patient and take time and learn by experience, you know, to get better and better. Here I'm just painting in the shark, blending in the shark a little bit more, making it look more painterly putting more, I suppose the shirts, I'm just doing, using the mixer brush to make it look, everything look more, I suppose, painterly, <laughs> blend things in together. The mixer brush is a great tool to, I have usually have the load on three, mix at 19% and about 20% on the other setting and I use the mixer brush to kind of blend things together, you know, and paint and, and smash it all together, blend it all together, should I say. Using the word smash a lot today, I don't know why. I think because I'm smashed up, just came from AMC Expo, I'm tired, so I'm, <laughs> I've been smashed around on the planes. Um, extremely exhausted. But it's all fun, it's all in the name of fun. Yeah, so we're getting there. I think, you know, we've only got, we've only got um, really the detailing process to go on this. Just you know, adding more fish, adding lighting, adding effects, detailing things up. This is me fixing up the shark, playing around with different. All I do is the painting of the shark. I've just gone in and changed the blend mode on it, and then painted on top of it. <laughs> Excuse me. So yeah, just a lot of, um, I'm fixing up the background again, because the character's really well done, it's now time to go back to the background and to the ship. And just to finish it off, you know, the background needs more detailing. Just adding a variety of blues and colors and, and textures, you know, and it's always good to do that. Like once you get something up to a really good level, you need to make sure everything's at the same level. And this is what I'm saying with photo textures or using kit bashing. If you start kit bashing, you start putting photos in your work, and you have like say a focal point that's all photo, and you can tell it's a photo, and the rest is a painting, that's when you failed, right? You need to make sure. I mean, I, I wouldn't say failed, but you've you're not achieving. You're basically creating a new style of art <laughs> that no one's done before. Well, not not. I wouldn't say that hasn't been done before, but that that isn't consistent. So, you know, if you are going to start using photo textures in, make sure it's blended in with the painting that you're doing. Make sure it's blended in with, with the, so it looks, still looks like a painting. You're using the photo to enhance your stuff. And same with photo, Photoshop brushes. If you're using a really textured brush, you know, make sure you get a brush that looks like, like painting strokes, or it looks like, you know, a texture that is, is not a photo collage, you know, or something like that. 
because you can create, you know, we, we'll go over Photoshop brushes and, and we can discuss all that sort of stuff as well in another video. So now it's just adding more detail to the work and what I do is I've got the saturation layer just checking that things are okay, got it in grayscale mode. The saturation layer allows me to see, um, I, I dump a black layer on top and I put it on saturation and allows me to see does it look good in black and white. That way just that allows me to check the values, you know, when you go to, you know, it allows me to fix things up. So here what I do is I grab another fish, I grab fish scales again. You know, actually, and I dump them in in the soft light layer above, and I start texturing in, in fish scales all over the, the mermaid itself, which was a fun part. And like I said, it's just I don't make it overly. You know, all I'm doing is adding texture to it. I can do that with a textured brush if I want to. You can actually make a textured brush for that. But in this case, I'm actually, um, I dump in a photo and it's in the soft light, light layer mode. And then I just, I increase the opacity or decrease the opacity. But it still looks like a painting, you know. But you can see the soft light, that, it, it's very opaque, it's very soft, it's very subtle. So it blends in, it doesn't compete with the painting, it just adds to it, you know, it gives it that texture. You know, and then I think I deleted it <laughs> for some reason or I deleted something. But, you know, I turn it on and off and I delete and I clean up things. I actually clean, I actually, what I did is I went back and I started cleaning up the painting because the, mer the mermaid tail needed some fixing up and then I whacked the texture back on just to check that it's all good. So just cleaning up things as much as possible. And here I'm doing, you know, because I studied goldfish tails, now I'm knowing my, because I, see the thing is when people say to me, or, or people say to other artists, you know, up and coming artists, or do your studies, don't create portfolio pieces, or don't create finish art, just do focus on studies. I think that helps to a degree. But you really need to have the experience of creating portfolio works in conjunction with your studies. Um, like this is a portfolio piece, I would say, but but I was doing studies while I was creating this. I was looking at the way goldfish tails work, right? And as you can see, that those t the tails, I created I created a hard line or a hard paint stroke, and then I had the soft strokes around it that that created the translucent fish tail or or fish. Um, scale look and so I actually um, I, I I did a study while I created a portfolio piece I studied how fish tails work you know in my portfolio you know so you know I could have done a study on a fish but instead I looked at the way fish tails work um, you know how to make a fish tail look believable and I applied it to this portfolio piece and I'm not saying don't just do studies definitely do your studies but if you want to create a portfolio piece, you know, if you've got time, I mean, I didn't have time. I just kind of did it as I went because I'm, I'm pretty fast now that I now I've got a, a really good speed up. But there's nothing wrong with if you're creating a portfolio piece, do a study of fish or look at the way, you know, look at if you're creating a, an environment, a, a fantasy landscape, go study how rocks work. You know, study a rock in your painting. You know, it's still a study. You're still if you're painting from reference you're still studying how things work you know and and this is where you know I've talked to other professionals and people that have worked for big studios and they said yeah we do some of us do do our studies like that I don't have time to do study much studying myself I read books about art um, I do study and I'm not saying I don't but I've got other things like I want to create my comic right now and I've got to a point where I'm really happy with my art quality I wouldn't say really happy, but I'm moderately happy with it because <laughs> uh, I could always do better. But the only way I could do studies is if I apply it to the work that I'm doing. You know, if I'm doing an epic landscape for Luminous Ages, I study um, 
you know, I take photos of things and I go and study how mountains work, look, how mountains look like in the distance, you know, and I recommend doing the same thing for you. Like if it, you know, even and, and a lot of people go, oh, if you're just beginning, you shouldn't really do that. You should just do studies. No, it's a good way to practice making a portfolio piece. Even if your portfolio piece ends up not being what you expect it to be, it's still an exercise that you've learned, you know, how to do a study of something while you're creating a portfolio work or an art print for whatever you're doing, a poster for a fan or a comic convention. So yeah, just, you know, it, it can get boring just doing studies alone. You know, a lot of people can get bored doing that. And, I, and I'm one of those people that did, I did, I used to do environment studies. I did environment studies for two months straight. I loved, I loved it for a while, but it does get tiring and boring just doing them non-stop. And I wanted to do something imaginative, so I took a break and I started creating my own work. And even my mentor at the time, who was Rob, who now is on my comic, said, yeah, you need to stop doing studies because it's showing that your studies are looking crap. You know, it does get boring doing studies. And this is what I say to students, try and mix up your learning. Now, if you're getting sick of, if you're burning out doing something, switch to something else. You know, like right now, I'm like, when I go to New Zealand, I'm actually, I was going to buy, I was really, I've got the, I've got the money to buy a Surface Pro. I really want one. I'm still thinking of getting one, but I'm actually, I really should stick to just doing some drawing, getting, because I'm getting too comfortable with digital tools. I love them, but I'm, I'm actually thinking I should stick to doing traditional drawing while I'm away and take a break from it. Um, and, and that way I can strengthen my drawing on the road. So point is, um, the point is, you know, try and mix up your learning. You know, try and don't just do one. But, you know, you could you can just focus on digital painting. There's nothing wrong with that, and that's what I've been doing for years and years. For the last two years, as I studied acrylic painting for years before that, so I was quite strong with my acrylic painting and traditional media as a fine artist. And but now I'm going back to fine art because I'm now doing original drawings for my for you, my patrons, and for everyone else. And I do enjoy traditional media. It's, it's there's something about it that it's different, you know. But um, like I said, there's nothing wrong with any tools. Use whatever tool that's going to make you produce really good work, you know, or keep you inspired, you know. And that's one way of I've got a lot of people asking me, you know, how do you deal with burnout? And I've been burnt out. Difference with me, a lot of artists when they get burnt out, they stop their art completely I don't stop my art I just stop enjoying it as much that's the difference I'm the kind of guy I can keep on working on a project it still will look amazing I think it still looks good my clients have been happy everyone's happy but I just don't enjoy it as much so I take a break from whatever it is I'm doing if I'm doing too much um, matte painting for, for clients and I'm getting sick of doing matte painting I stop the matte painting projects I hand it on to someone else in my studio and then I go to digital traditional media or I do digital painting instead. Whatever I whatever's gonna keep me productive if I'm burnt out. Sometimes taking a break completely from art is good, but you've got to get back on that bandwagon eventually. But I I, I suppose being an industry professional and having done it for five years now full time, I suppose I figured out ways of working through burnout and the best way is to just keep on drawing or finding things that inspire you, and um, I suppose for me it's just I've worked, I've work, learned to work through the burnout. You know, I just keep on working. I, I don't surrender, kind of thing. I just keep on going, and even if I don't enjoy it, I just find ways of enjoying it. You know, and and it's not that, you know I don't want to say I don't enjoy it. I've actually there's a lot been a lot of stuff I've enjoyed in the last two years, but you know I'm learning. Strat you learn strategies to do art. So here I'm actually painting in with a textured brush. You can see I'm using a textured brush, so not a photo. And that brush is in my, I think it's brush number, well, I'm using a hard brush, but it's on the dual brush setting. And I'm using a number, what is it? I'll let you know in a minute, because I'm still deciding in the video. <laughs> I think I'm using like a number 100. And I'm going in and just adding texture to the, to the boat. You know, and that's the thing. Like when I when I here I'm using photo. Te I'm using textured brushes. I've also used photo textures. 
But like, for me, I was doing so much kit bashing last year. Um, photo kit bashing is where you start off with a photo plate, you add a lot of photos and a lot of paint, you blend it in with painting and stuff. That I actually got burnt out with photo kit bashing last year. I got sick of it and I'm like, no, I actually want everything to start. I want to start painting everything from scratch and only rely on photos a little bit. And now I'm like, now I want to just paint and only rely on textured brushes. And, and it's not because there's nothing wrong with doing those other things. It's just that I want to mix up the way I work and have different techniques and different strategies to make keep everything interesting. And that's why here, all I've really done, the two techniques I've done is using textured brushes, the whole piece, and a bit of photo textures, only a, a mild amount of photo textures on really repetitive things like fish scales. So here I'm just cleaning up everything. I haven't really talked too much about what I'm doing on this because all I'm really doing is rendering everything. There's not much to talk about. I mean, I think you sit there and go, here is another brush stroke, here's another this, here's another fish scale. I'm trying to give you stuff that's going to help you as an artist. So in this talk, you know, I'm talking about, you know, I've talked about burnout, how to deal with burnout, um, how to, um, what tools to use, you know, you know, do you use digital, do you use traditional, um, how to approach them. And um, also a little bit about color theory, you know, this pink, you know, the color theory, color theory is really important. It creates focal, focal points, it creates um, visual interest, contrast and harmony. And you need both in work. So as you can see, I've even um, I'm just going around tidying up everything. I'm adding more hair strokes, like hair, uh, fine hairs to her her beautiful long pink pink red hair. I should say dark pink hair. And I'm doing that with a soft brush, and I'm just adding in more fish scales. I'm adding in highlights to the fish scales. I'm painting that in and duplicating the layer, just seeing how things work. You know, different setting scenarios. And we're getting there, so it's really this is at this stage. All I'm really doing is I'm adding more attention to detail. And all I've done here as well is I've actually just grabbed. I created a shadow at the bottom in a soft light layer, and I dragged a really dark blue up from the bottom up. So that way we can put more darkness behind, underneath her, and behind her to draw attention to the character. Again, the point is. She's a mermaid queen, she's beautiful, she's a strong character, the focus is her and the trident. And here I'm just adding, fixing up the fins, adding, making them look more like fishtails, you know, we studied the fishtails, how they work. So now, now that I have that knowledge of how a fishtail looks, you know, I can probably paint a fishtail off the, off the top of my head, you know, from start, start to about three quarters of the way there. But I would still look at a fish tail anyway, even if I have studied already. I still look at it because there's something else you can find about a fish tail that makes it look more realistic, you know. So everything's really detailed at this point. I'm really happy with the detail level of detail, and now I'm just adding effects. I'm actually going in with the color dodge layer, and I'm adding like, I suppose, light, as light goes through water, cats this cascading light effect. I'm just adding that into the painting now in the color dodge layer behind the character. I think it works, but I think um, you know there's some you know a painting's never done. When is a painting ever done? Seriously. So you know I'm going in. I'm adding the, the color dodge effect around the trident as well, around the staff, so that pops out. And you know this is now it's like it's at the point of no return. And what that means is. No matter what you do to the painting, people aren't really going to notice much of a difference. They're not going to go, oh, it's, you know, it's a totally different piece. At this point, you're just adding things that people may like or they may not like, and it's just really subjective. And like I said, even when I go when I go and submit this, say, to Magic the Gathering, um, late November or whenever I do it, I'm going to, you know, rework this again and change it, you know, you know, change the effects but it will be you know at the point where it might be may not be noticeable it may be noticeable to them but on a large scale like to, to the public they're not going to notice these different changes but other artists may who are professionals um, even you guys might even notice it 
and I will post up probably an update on the Patreon and just say, hey, this is the portfolio version that I submitted just for you all to have a look at and have as another copy, a digital file. So yeah, I'm just um, adding in the effects. I do a color dodge layer on above the, the actual mermaid and one below her. So that way I can play around with the lighting of that color dodge. Yeah, and I make, what I did is I add dark, dark, she's got dark shadow on the side of her face, but then I add the color dodge behind that, that dark area so it really pops out. All I'm doing is adding detail here. So finishing off the moment, it's pretty much done. This point, the painting is pretty much completed. I mean, all I do is add, I added a color balance layer at the end and a levels layer. And, you know, I played around with it until I was happy with it. And I just, and I'm just switching it on and off and just checking that it all works. And I'm just painting all I'm at this, at this point, I'm just noodling the details. I'm just refining the details, making sure that you know everything looks really good you know just cleaning it all up you know all the there's no kind of weird marks or weird um, things happening in the piece you know fit cleaning up every single hair stroke and all that sort of stuff just really refining it as much as possible You know, it's just it's just really refining every edge, every detail, everything. That's all. And, and, and I'm always checking the values, even if I've finished finish the painting and I've done, say I do a color balance adjustment or levels adjustment, I then I switch on that saturation layer, the black and white layer, put on saturation mode and I just check it, you know, does the character pop out? And it does, you know, I was pretty happy with that. Right, even right till the end. And I got my signature down the bottom, so we're at the end now. <laughs> this is the point where I'm happy with it and it's just fixing it up tidying it up as much as possible. This is the OCD part of me. The OCD artist. You know, just playing around with all the fishes, moving them around. That's why it's really good to have everything in different layers, because you can still, even if they're painted in a different way, you can still move things around. You can copy and paste them and duplicate things and paint, play around with them as much as you can. Yeah, so the cool thing about the mermaid race is that most of them are pretty, they're they're really good. They're on the side of the tranquil, most of them. There are some corrupt mermaids as well. Um, but um, they are meant to be good. That's why they look pretty, you know. And um, they're defending the oceans from being harvested by the mayor majors who are the, the, the alliance of the mayor who are kind of doing their best to destroy the ocean. Um, I, and I think that they simply, you know, they, they a lot of the oceans have dream pool energy, like when they have a, a pool of water that's got a lot of dream energy in it. And so the mermaids defend those pools of, of water. They, you know, they can, 
mermaids are really um, they're also mystical in the fact that they can teleport from an ocean into an actual river or a lake you know they have the power to teleport you know create teleportal devices and and, and they teleport with the, with the devices from the from the tranquil mages from the luminary and the captive very mages so here all I did is just looked at reference and I'm still looking at references of the goldfish and also light lighting in water how to create dynamic lighting in water and just finishing adding more touches to that at the end which looks really cool And that's it guys I think really um, nothing much to say here as you can see it's just playing around with it at the end adding more details to the fishtail making them look more luminescent transparent as you can see I'm studying that you know I've studied how to do a fishtail in this and how to paint that in and hopefully that helps you you know all I've used is a soft brush to create that make it look like a proper fishtail and um, as you all know, you are, as I said before, you're all welcome, you know, to ask me questions. I don't, you know, on the Patreon, if you're a patron, you support me on Patreon, it's my duty to help you out. My duty is to guide you all and give you some tips and advice. And you can even ask me stuff about, you know, Luminous Ages, um, how I'm creating it all. Um, anything really, as long as it's not too personal. <laughs> Um, but yeah, anything to do with art, happy to help you all out with it. And um, you know, you can send me a private message. You can leave a comment if there's something I post and you, you know you want to ask about it. You know, you can just leave a comment on on the post on uh, Patreon. And you know, I mean, I may not get. Sometimes I can get to it straight away. You know, and if I don't get to it, you eventually I'll eventually get to it. In, you know, every three or four days, I try and look at my Patreon and just check. You know, there's no comments there and try and respond to people as soon as I can. And the exciting thing is, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, cool things coming up that I'm going to be creating. So it's going to be dream the Dreamscape Islands piece where I'm already probably about two-thirds of the way through it and that'll be coming out uh, November over November and then you all will be able to vote for the next topic for December and it's going to be public domain topics so you know something within you know fantasy no sorry something within mythology um, and the public domain so something from like you know maybe Hercules or um, Alice in Wonderland anything that's public domain that you know people like no characters that you know of that we can paint that are legends or part of fairy tales and mythology should be fun and so all I'm doing here is just last minute effects you know adding in a hard light layer creating more lighting and I don't like what I did here to be honest with you I mean I know like it, it works but I kind of have to push it back <laughs> I kind of got rid of it in the end I think I kept it, but I, I've decided I'm probably going to have to work, change it a bit more. But it still looks cool. It's not bad. It's just, you know, like I said, art is never done. You always can add more to paintings. There's me adding more detail at the end to the face and the hairs. If you also, one thing we're doing also is if, if um, you have any recommendations even for the voting topics, um, we, we, I will take in some recommendations just as long as it's not um, something that uh, is already copyrighted. But if you want to send me a message, oh, you know, can you put this as a voting topic? I don't see why not. Um, as long as it's something from fantasy, horror or mythology or, you know, I'm happy to consider it as a topic and include it. 
in the next um, in topics as well. Um, and it will obviously be dependent on it, whether it gets in is dependent on demand, you know. And that's why we need to increase um, the patrons because um, that way, if there's more people voting, there's more chances of things being voted in. You know, if, and we're going to try and limit it to about ten topics a month because that way there's a better chance of um, the topics being picked. You know, the ones that people like. So at least if there's a hundred people, and one topic gets picked. Well, if they say there's a thousand people, and you know, one out of the ten topics gets picked at least a hundred people are going to be happy <laughs> you know um, I don't think people are going to be dissatisfied but at least it gives more chances of people um, getting a say in what they want also you can commission me to do something if, if there's something that you want like in a digital painting you know um, we've got the different tiers um, and so I think you know the $125 tier we can do a rough digital painting or a digital sketch like I did for Lee uh, something like that, something that, take, that I can whip up for you in a couple of days, two or three days, which is actually a bargain. Um, and we also have the um, cameo appearance. And, and so, if you want to, even if you don't want to have your cameo in the comic, or you want, even if you want the cameo appearance, is it just for your face? If you want to recommend, um, you know, if you want someone else to be drawn into it, or if you want to have, you want to be you want to create a character, you know, a character like a dragon of some sort that has a cameo in the in the comic. We can do that as well. We can tailor it to whatever you have in mind for the comic. And preferably, it has to be fantasy um, because it's got to fit the fan the theme of the comic. Um, but if there's like, you know, you for two twenty five, if you want to go, okay, can you do um, a weapon? You know, can you make Thrakos have a staff? He, 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 for one page, he has a new staff that he tries and it breaks. You know, I'm happy to do that. Um, I think it'd be cool. Uh, just to get you guys involved and, you know, give you all the exclusive content for that. Again, just detailing stuff, <laughs> fixing things up, using a smudge tool to clean things up, make things look a little bit more interesting, blending things at the end. Yeah, I, I suppose the only thing that I would do to this, you know, like I said, for, for a different version, a darker fuel or something for a portfolio piece for to submit to Magic the Gathering, the only thing I would actually do is, like I said, go in and just change the, the mood or the lighting, like not actually add any more detail to the mermaid, but just change it so that things look more darker around her and she pops out more, even more. I think she still pops out now, but something to do with the blues, it, it doesn't. When you go to color, it may pop out in grayscale mode, but because of the color mode, when you go into color, it, does, it doesn't as much as it should. That's all part of living and learning, and um, like I said, everyone will still get a uh, get a digital copy of the update. Any updates that I do to any of the work, that's why you're all patrons. <laughs> you get all the exclusive stuff. But anyway, um, I think we're at the end now, so it's all done. I want to thank you all again for subscribing. Uh, it's amazing to have you on board. I'm so glad we hit the $500 milestone. Everyone gets to vote. Yay! And um, as long as we keep above that five hundred dollar milestone, we'll keep on doing the voting. And um, I'm I'm pretty sure we've got like three more conventions left. I just come from Melbourne, so more people that come on board, it's going to help. It's basically going to allow as we hit when we get to fifteen hundred dollars, if we can, if you can spread the word to your friends. Um, when we get to fifteen hundred dollars, it's going to be more content, more concept art, and more stuff. So thank you so much. Um, I hope you like this painting, spread the word, and um, I wish you all the best on your art, and see you on Patreon, and feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you.